We open on the bridge to find Tom Paris reporting for his shift late. Instead of taking it on the chin, he tries to make up some entirely fictional and obviously transparent excuses because Tom Paris is a dick. Third time this week, as pointed out by Chicote, and again, I presume we're setting him up for a fall. Here's hoping we get some unexpected growth out of it. Speaking of unexpected growths, they detect a distress call from our old friends the Plague Lads, the race who keep nicking body parts from other species to combat their space plague, and who killed a named guy called Durst last season. There's only one life sign, and it doesn't look like there are any other ships around, so let's go take a look. We teleport the Plague Lad aboard to discover it's actually a Plague Lady, and she's in bad shape. There are ongoing organ failures and some cerebral problems, which the doctor isn't sure how best to treat, but he notices she has a flashy thing installed in the side of her head. On inspection, it seems to function as a sort of buffer for her neural activity, and the doc thinks he'll be able to use this to transfer her brain to Voyager's holographic systems, in the hopes that she has an opinion on a treatment plan for herself. Before we do that, we're taken through the process of constructing a holographic body for her, a decision which seems to exist just as an excuse to look at some Vidian lumpy bits, as we prove ourselves perfectly capable of adding clothes. While the Doc and Kez are playing dress-up, Chicote and Janeway are discussing the Plague Lady. Looks like her ship was on the way to a Plague Lad colony that they'll be passing in a few weeks, so we'll offload her there if she's still alive. That settled, Chicote raises the topic of Paris. Given the nature of Paris's arrival on Voyager, Janeway grabbed him from prison for their original mission, Chicote wants to give Janeway the chance to step in before he resorts to discipline. No favourites here, says Janeway, and confirms Chicote has the authority to do whatever he thinks is right, which is either supporting Chicote's position or palming the problem off to him, depending on which way you look at it. Back in Sick Bay, the Doc is ready to squirt the Plague Lady's brain into her new hollow body. She wakes up and the doctor explains the situation to her, that she's a projection of her original form based on unaltered DNA from her physical body. He's arrogant and prideful at the skill he's shown in performing the task, so much so that he's confused by her psychological response to the situation, and we were reminded of the limitations of his growth, that lack of empathy he sometimes exhibits, in situations of which he has no concrete knowledge, and, oh my god, I've just realised why I like him. He's neurodivergent, misreading social cues, attention to detail that most people dismiss as pedantry, a sense of humour that appeals to a select few. The bastard is me! If you're watching this and you're neurotypical, this is a perfect example of what it's like being on the spectrum. We can spot plot holes that an entire production company misses, yet it takes 26 hours of watching to understand why we've imprinted on a character. But again, I digress. We learn that our guest first contracted Space Plague when she was seven and started receiving transplants at the same time. We also learn her name is Denara, and she's a hematologist who was on her way back from visiting a plague-lad colony after an outbreak. The doc says her medical knowledge should help them devise treatments for her, as her neural pattern can only be held in the system for a few days before it starts to break down and needs to be transferred back to her physical body. Based on her reaction to seeing herself, though, that may not be something she considers desirable. Balana's in sick bay, telling the doc he can go do one after he asks her for a donation of her brain tissue. Fair play to the writers here, I wasn't sure they'd remember that Klingon DNA is resistant to space plague. Dinara overhears the argument and interrupts. She's heard what one of her species did to Balana, the kidnap and medical experimentation. Acknowledging that curing the space plague has become an obsession to her people, and that many have chosen to ignore the moral implications of their actions, she stresses that she only wants Balana's assistance if she consents to the procedure. Again, like the Kazon, we're examining what a sentient species will do to survive the lines it's willing to cross under extreme circumstances. Balana relents and agrees to the procedure. Afterwards, the Doc and Dinara are discussing the procedure. There's a professional camaraderie, but perhaps something more there on her part. While we wait a few days to see if the graft takes, the doc suggests deactivating Dinara's program to prevent the degradation he mentioned before, but she resists. Having the toll of a chronic condition lifted from her has filled her with energy for the first time in her adult life, and she wants to explore the ship. That's not possible, explains the doctor, except, well, there is a place they could go perhaps not considering the potential issues of bringing a date to an establishment run by his ex, he suggests the Paris misogyny pub. 
She's delighted by the place, a stance subject to change when she's introduced to both Neelix and a holographic gigolo. The doc tells them both to fuck off as they're bothering his patient, but not before Denara flinches away after being asked to dance by the holographic fuckboy. In her culture, people unaffected by space plague revile and cast out those afflicted with the condition. The attention is a new experience for her, and rather disconcerting. She turns to the topic of the doctor's name, asking if, as he doesn't have one, she might choose one herself. Before he can respond, she offers Schmullus, the name of an uncle she liked. The doc mulls it over and says he likes it, despite it sounding to me like a type of Ferengi ear infection, and I'm sure that the plot element of his name has now been swiftly and satisfyingly concluded. As their evening draws to an end, they return to sickbay and engage in some post-date awkwardness, presumably while the doc tries to stamp down all of the screaming subroutines about patient fraternization. Some clumsy verbal fumbling ensues where each isn't sure how to proceed before the doc turns her off, possibly in more ways than one. In the mess hall, Chicote approaches Paris and tries to find out why he's been a turbo dick lately. The reason, Paris says, is Chicote. He thinks Chicote has been micromanaging and that he's not the only one who feels this way. After his little tantrum, he leaves, but not before we're shown that the whole thing was witnessed by Traitor Guy, who passes this on to his Kazon contact. Very interesting, says the Kazon. A bit of disorder might be useful and, oh, by the way, we want you to sabotage the warp core. This is a bit much, even for Traitor Guy, who says he won't do shit till he speaks to Seska and hangs up. The Doc is running a self-diagnostic. He's been experiencing lapses in concentration that Kez suggests might be related to the presence of Denara. We have a little chat over the nature of romantic attraction and the messy, messy things it does to our brains. The Doc asks what he should do if he wants to explore that possibility, and Kez responds that telling Denara how he feels would be the first step in the process. Tangentially, I'm again confused as to why somebody with the medical knowledge of hundreds of cultures doesn't see why this is a deeply problematic overstepping of a professional boundary, but, well, who knows? Maybe Andorian doctors fuck all their patients or something. Anyway, we rejoin them all performing a test on Denara's brain, and the doc decides this is the time to mention he fancies her, to the predictable response of everyone else concerned. If I hadn't figured out he's on the spectrum earlier, this would probably have done it. Turns out that asking to be someone's boyfriend when you're probing their brain isn't as successful as the doc had expected, and she asks to keep their relationship professional. Good to see that at least one doctor who understands why that's wise. We're in the misogyny pub, and the doc comes in looking for Paris and some advice. What follows may be the best line I've ever heard in Star Trek. I assume you've had a great deal of experience being rejected by women. <laughs> The doc asks about how to deal with the aftermath of rejection. The unfortunate truth, says Paris, is that while it does get easier, it often never truly heals. Guessing this is about the doc, he asks for more information to see if he can help. The doc explains and Paris suggests the response may be due to shyness and his approach, and offers some pointers which I'm sure will be just as classy as he is. While they're gossiping, Denara and Kez are doing much the same. Denara admits the attraction from the Doctor is reciprocal, though doesn't call him Schmuller, so I guess we're abandoning that for now, and that her response was because of his bloody awful delivery surprising her. Compliments and attention are something she struggles with due to her past, but cares, perhaps because of the timescale in which she lives, tells Denara that she believes there's nothing more sad than a missed opportunity. Paris doesn't disappoint on the creepy bastard front, and the Doc waits for Denara in a Chevy on a cliff, presumably with a couple of boxes of cheap wine in the back to complete the scene. Denara arrives, and they both awkwardly try to understand Paris's idea of romance. Despite the barriers he's put in place for them, they somehow manage to hit it off anyway. I wonder if it's possible to get hollow pregnant. Speaking of genitals, Paris is late for his shift again. Not to worry, though, as he's been replaced. In fact, he needn't turn up at all until he gets his shit together. Paris's reaction to this is unfavourable, and off he goes to the brig. The theme of descent continues with Traitor Guy getting a call from Seska. Everything's fine, she's got all his messages, and please, do the sabotage thing. Everything will be great, promise. Oh, and I'm going to capture the ship so you can either comply or die with the others. Ciao! It's time to reintegrate Denara's cerebral pattern with her body, except there's a problem. The graft is failing. 
we discover somebody has injected her with a substance that increases the chance of rejection, and Dinara admits it was her, called it. She doesn't want to go back to a life of pain and exile, but the Doc doesn't want to lose the time he could have with her as, if she reintegrates, they'll still have two weeks before they reach her colony. Without it, she'll be dead in a couple of days. His attraction was never to her aesthetic, but to her mind, and each possible second with her is precious to him. In the end, she agrees to the procedure, giving them the chance to explore the time they have left before we fly away. End of episode.